the letter that came to us said, this is probably the most exciting architectural commission in Europe today. Wow, this is a huge leap in project size for us. This was a major public building. Like a sort of campaign in a battle, we decided to go absolutely hell for leather. My guess is this will be just like a road. By the time it's completed, the business throat will be so great that you'll jolly soon have to start another one. In the late uh, 1980s, the uh, Channel Tunnel had been approved and the decision had been made that the ter terminal was going to be at Waterloo. The idea of going to France by train was, was a kind of glamorous concept in its own right then. And so the ex-terminal had to be heroic in some way. But the site was a nightmare, actually. It was a long, thin slice along the side of Waterloo Station, which used to incorporate the, the trains to Richmond. When you look at it on plan, or from the air for that matter, it's a very odd shape because it starts off straight and then there's a curve and then it tapers down. It was a bit like being given a foot uh, and having to design a sock to pull over it. It was a very complex shape to deal with. And so that really informed many of the kind of design solutions behind the station. It was our gateway to Europe. So what we wanted to do was something with a twist where we had the kind of elegance of the great Victorian railway halls but at the same time glazed to London, so you could see these beautiful trains drawing in and out, and you had a level of transparency and kind of facade to the city. We worked out we could slide the ticket check, passport check, and departure lounge underneath the railway viaducts. So then it was possible to actually have a single roof structure from the buffers at the town end to the narrower country end. However, there was very, very little space uh, to get the structure down because the train on the city side was right on the edge with very little clearance. So we ended up having to design an arch form, but an asymmetrical arch, which went down very steeply on the side facing the river. And then we had to have a way of actually being able to change that span from 55 metres down to 35 metres as it steps down through the station. We had to devise a structure which, in a sense, could, could uh, telescope on itself to make a lesser and lesser and lesser span. So we were left with, you know, this very complex, asymmetrical, twisting structural form. And as a sort of engineering logistics proposition, it's actually quite a problem. The Bovis construction management team and the client, they were all really, 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 really worried about this roof and how, you know, how complicated it seemed. This is because often the way a, a designer would deal with glazing, a complex changing form, is to make different shaped sheets of glass. You break it up in a kind of fractal pattern. Uh, and that means every sheet is individual. Everyone's unique. So it's very complicated, uh, it's very expensive, and takes a long time. There was a terrific hoo-ha about it and a, a, lot of, a lot of opposition. So we had to find a solution. We all loved the Crystal Palace, which is a sort of iconic building for all of us. And of course, that grew from a very simple structural idea and, and a component system. If we could design a set of bits, pieces, and castings that could be used universally for all the joints in all the assemblies, then that would be brilliant. We said, right, we're going to try and make every sheet of glass in that roof a rectangle, and we're going to solve the dimensional discrepancies by overlapping. The glass was in rectangular panels, and they overlapped like fish scales. Like this. But because the span was getting smaller and smaller, the angle of that arch changed, so we had to be able to adjust that. 
and we came up with a casting which was two parts with little teeth all round it so you could turn them and lock them and they held the mullions for the glass in exactly the right position for that section of the arch. So what we'd done was to design a family of components that could do the solid roof, the glass roof, the truss, the ceiling panel. And it turned out to be a brilliant decision because the repetition was such that it made assembly much simpler, much cheaper. And when the construction management team and the client actually understood it, there was a collective sigh of relief from all the, all the managers and the money men. They said, God, this is all right, it's going to work. Waterloo is very mechanistic and it's very simple in its execution and everything is made out of rectangles. And so it just shows you that you can actually use a very rational, simple structure to achieve a very complex, organic, twisting, almost natural form. I don't think anyone looking at those first views of it thought it wasn't heroic enough. <laughs> <laughs> and it was rather wonderful because of the uh, curviness of the track. You could stand at, at the concourse end and look, and you could, it could have gone on forever away from you, sort of snaking to and fro, which is a wonderful effect, really. You know, everyone talks about the roof. I was, I was very pleased with the way some of the, the, the undercroft spaces came out, too. A lot of people commented on the integrity of the whole experience. This is the departure lounge. It's smaller than most international airports, but the family resemblance is quite striking. It's expected that 3,000 passengers will pass through here every hour. When your train is called for boarding, you head for one of the many escalators which lead up onto the platforms. There are movable screens separating departing passengers moving up the escalator from those who've just arrived walking on down the ramp into the arrivals hall below. People ask me what my most important project is, I would always say Waterloo, I think, without a doubt. <laughs>